uh, mm -hmm. other hours. Um, okay, great. Let's begin. So uh, welcome everybody back to our Microtastic seminar series in the new year, 2024. I hope everybody had a good uh, new year holiday. Um, so today we also have two excellent speakers in the lineup. Our first speaker today is uh, Professor Ling Ling Shui, and she is a professor at the South China Normal University. She obtained her PhD from the BIOS and Lab on a Chip group at 20 University in the Netherlands. And her current group is named um, the Laboratory of Optofluidic Technology and Systems, or LOTS. And she works mostly on droplet-based microfluidics and their applications. Um, their group has published over 200 research articles and issued over 100 patents uh, in this area. And I know she has uh, some strong industry collaborations that are implementing her work in commercial applications. So um, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Ling Ling. Okay, thank you, Angela. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening for everyone because we, have, we are from different countries. Now I will share you my presentation. Okay, you can all can see my slides. Okay, uh, good morning uh, for my time. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Cindy to invite me to give this presentation in this uh, microtastic. <laughs> it's nice to be here. So today I will bring my uh, talk. Um, it's actually from our group's focus area. It's named the droplet confined particle and molecular assembly and applications. I'm from South China Normal University located in South China at Guangzhou. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, assembly or we call it self-assembly is a very important. Uh, we learned it's a tool or it's a technology which can bring material science, physics, to even biology. And uh, <clears throat> these two pictures I uh, cited from the uh, references, it shows how the technology uh, and the materials brings bridges together of uh, physics and my biology and even the, uh, um, how's it, the our thinking, how our uh, human body and our brain works. Uh, as we also know, uh, I think pe most people working in the area of microfluidics or micro tasks or even lab on chip, we know at the micro scale or even nano scale, the parameters uh, which are play important roles, or we say the key parameters, including uh, show, including a lot of uh, the easiest and simplest, and also the key points are the forces. What we think are uh, playing uh, around uh, the the devices. This, uh, this table shows uh, uh, some dimensionless number and uh, it shows the, um, the ratio between different uh, forces. And if we, for example, uh, show uh, calculate this, uh, these values, we can get the, the ratio and then we know which one is more important. For example, like the capillary number, which is one of the most important parameters working in the droplet microfluidics, it uh, presents the viscous force to the interfacial force. At this uh, stage, we know that uh, in the interfacial tension or interfacial force plays the, uh, is the key point, which can um, determine how the multi-phase flow or whether the droplet can form easily or not. These are the videos recorded in our lab. We show the different ways of working uh, of droplet, droplet uh, generation. Uh, you may also know that the first one is the flow focusing device and step flow. And uh, we also developed the capillary capillary based open microfluidic devices, which can help the labs, which may not have a nanofabrication lab. We can use just a capillary to uh, generate droplet by pushing and by making the gaps between uh, the capillary tip and the a flat surface. And the droplet size is determined by the 
gap distance between the capillary and the uh, surface. Uh, for this one, I would also suggest the, the students or the labs which may not fabricate micro device can use such kind of uh, easy and cheap device to make droplet. Okay, and recently uh, we also developed a technology which can make droplet by electric fusion or we call electrical lessons. We make this uh, uh, droplet, the multiple dispersed droplet by just uh, uh, screen printing to bike wheels. Uh, when we applied electric field, electric field across, uh, yeah, across the droplet, the small droplet will coalesce into uh, mono dispersed droplet like we show on this uh, um, screen. And these are the images uh, the, for the application we have uh, presented. We, we can culture cells and uh, vi uh, bacteria inside the droplet. And then it's, the, the result is quite good because in this way we can digitalize the, and read these uh, results easily. Yeah, uh, we have po uh, for the, because we, we have students and colleagues from different uh, background like physics and chemistry and also biology. So we have also tried to make different types of droplet like water in oil or oil in water for different purposes. For uh, chemical synthesis, we would like to use organic phase, which we named oil phase to make, uh, uh, to make this uh, droplet as a microreactor, but for biology or biomedical applications, water is the most uh, often mostly used uh, medium. So the oil in water, the water in oil droplet are the most required uh, uh, style uh, types. So um, yeah, this was done actually many years ago in my PhD. So we tried to coat the surface of the micro channel to hydrophilic or hydrophobic. We can easily tune the hydrophilic uh, to the droplet type. Like this one is the oil, water in oil on the top and the bottom one is um, oil in water droplet by just uh, change the surface wettability of the channels without changing anything in the uh, uh, in the, the liquid the liquid phase. Of course, the droplet uh, stability were determined by the chemical, the, the surfactant, but the droplet types were determined by the well, surface wettability of the microchannels or capillaries. Yeah, <clears throat> for extra external applications, for, for example, for the micro shares or micro capsules, we need to make a multiple emulsion droplet, like water in oil in water or oil in water in oil. Uh, this is the continuous of the pre previous work. We, we uh, our students smartly tried to, the, to use uh, thermal responsive uh, materials, which is named the NIPA. I think most many uh, people know this. This uh, material is uh, some of uh, the, the surface wettability can be uh, controlled by the temperature. So we just add the heat underneath one of the junctions. We can make this uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic by changing the temperature. So in this way, we can make multiple emulsion droplets. Yeah, and we have also tried to make water in oil, a water in water droplet, which uh, which is actually a like a, a co-shear structure. The the shear formed between two aqueous phase by uh, complexation, it, which is uh, uh, opt uh, optically charged. The um, uh, we named the poly poly. Uh, the electrostatic force and polyelectrolyte across the they, they attract to each other by electrostatic force and then cross link at the interface to form a watering water uh, kosher structure we named the watering or water droplet or capsule yeah for the droplet we have tried the different types of droplet generation methods and uh, the size could be tuned in nano to micrometers and the types could also be changed by the combination of the uh, liquid phase and the surface wettability. Of course, the frequency is also important for the for real application. As we showed before, like the channel-based droplet is very stable, but they may be, <clears throat> they need uh, some 
chips to create. And for the capillary devices, which can be integrated to multiple capillaries together, we can create the droplet to very high speed. And materials could, and applications determined on the group's application, uh, for group, the, the, the working groups and the, the also from the industrial oh. requirement. Yeah, uh, now we would, uh, I will show you the assembly application using draw plate. As we also know that uh, in our uh, system, actually we have different types of system from atom, atoms to the galaxies. There is the, the, the size range, the scale range is very, very large, but uh, uh, assembly or self-assembly is uh, integrated everywhere. And in our group, we focused in the like the red color uh, area. We uh, used the droplet uh, confined uh, assembly of liquid crystal material uh, molecules, colloidal particles, which uh, is also called colloidal colloidal crystals. And the fluid in, in fluid is the medium, and it also works as a self-assembly um, targets. Yeah, these are the um, pictures we normally present to students and to uh, new researchers. And the size from, uh, yeah, from Anstru and to even light year, is this range uh, from our uh, like uh, um, it? Let me see. It's it's everywhere, and uh, we have also have some uh, natural and uh, uh, artificial uh, assemble the structures from the literatures. It works. Uh, it's from molecules to optoelectronic. Uh, molecules and also for the micro size assembly and even to mini um, millimeter to uh, centimeter size. And uh, of course, we started from the nanoparticles. Nanoparticles can easily be obtained from our own lab and also from colleagues and the industry. We, we put the particles into the droplet phase, which we also call the inner phase in the droplet microdics. And by making the droplet, the particles are confined inside the droplet. After evaporation, the particles will assemble into um, mostly ordered structures. And this combination can be even like uh, uh, one type of particles and two types of particles, and even the particles with different properties and shapes. Yeah, the confined molecular assembly is many, um, the target is uh, liquid crystal. Liquid crystal, we, we know it has been used everywhere in our, uh, like our screen, our uh, telephone, and a lot of uh, uh, microscopy and also optoelectronic devices. Actually, um, liquid crystal molecules are not spherical. They are like uh, uh, this shape. We call the, uh, it has a, um, how to call this shape? We call this, um, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a spherical. So the, the, it's not a homogeneous. It has, a, a, when it uh, uh, rotate, it, it will show different uh, properties. So we confined this, uh, uh, this molecules into droplets as we do in the previous slides, we put them into the um, interface and they can find the insights. And after some time, because of the surface, the interface has different surfactants. Surfactant also um, uh, can, um, act, can anchor on the interface either in the vertical way or in a parallel way. So the liquid crystal molecules will align together along with the uh, surfactants, either in the vertical way or to the parallel way. So they can show different, uh, um, we call the photonic or optical configurations will be different. We are also using this to, uh, to uh, get to make a sensing devices. I will show you later. Yeah. <clears throat> Of course, for the um, assembly, after assembly, we should we, we, we want to get the functions of the surface. 
there are multi ways to further manipulate the surface. One way is to add extra uh, materials. Uh, in this way, we would deposit a layer of metal, like uh, we mostly use the gold on the surface. And after that, we uh, heat or laser right in the surface to make this uh, gold surface, uh, gold film to divide. During the deweighting, by controlling the speed of the deweighting, we can get uh, monodisperse, mostly, yeah, not, not monodisperse, but a highly uh, homogeneous nano, uh, gold nanoparticles standing on the surface of the uh, silicon oxide uh, nanoparticles and further uh, heating the surface, the gold will uh, evaporate and leave a thin layer of gold and even um, sitting into the into the uh, silicon oxide surface to form a hole form holes on the surface by this way the due to the uh, coupling between the photonic crystal from the silicon oxide and the uh, gold nanoparticle photonic uh, uh, photonic properties they were either coupling or decoupling to show uh, one type uh, one color or two colors in um, when we view it under our, our microscope. Yeah, this is uh, the, the same um, uh, mechanism, but just uh, uh, from heating to laser writing, because the laser writing has the uh, advantages of uh, uh, patternable. It it just like this way, it has a very uh, the, the micro size uh, laser point we can write on the surface to write uh, to make these uh, um, nanoparticles with different uh, patterns okay and um, furthermore we, it's also surprisingly find that uh, during our uh, heating up into the in the oven we see that not only the diverting of the non, the gold uh, uh, gold film and after a while if the uh, the the oven is not uh, um, uh, if the oven is filled with extra uh, gas, we could also find the VLS, the vapor liquid solid reaction, to grow the uh, nanowires on the surface. And uh, by different structures, we could also see the patterning of this, uh, like photonic crystal, and even with the uh, uh, complex photonic properties found on the surface. Yeah, this is a more extreme example. By step by step growth, is also available. We could uh, growth different types of uh, uh, nano wires on the surface of the our capsules. Okay, now we move to the application of these structures. For this one, uh, it's also uh, corresponding to the previous one. We have put uh, have deposited different layers, uh, different thickness of the gold vapor. Then we can uh, gold film. Then you can see the 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 formation of the hot spots. We named hot spots from the source surface the Raman uh, surface enhanced Raman sp spectroscopy. By tuning the gap distance, we can get uh, enhanced the source enhancement uh, very high and. We have achieved the surface enhancement factor of about ten to ten to the power ten and even ten to the power thirteen. These are the homogeneity and the reproducibility of the structures we used the microcapsules to the the, the previous showed the uh, structures and the uh, in intensity the enhancement is is high and also reproducible and. Uh, repeatable on different uh, microcapsules. And the most um, uh, attracting properties is that it can be, uh, each micro capsule can work as a micro unit of sensing. And in this way, we could get a high density of the micro, uh, we can also uh, further <laughs> pattern, further pattern the, uh, and pattern or digitalize the sensing area to have uh, high throughput sensing applications. Okay, and then when we put the uh, liquid crystal into the droplet, like showed before, and we re uh, and 
furthermore, the uh, I would also uh, tell the maybe some not everyone know the uh, liquid crystal. This is a chiral liquid crystal. It has uh, um, like this periodical um, structure. Like there, yeah, in this way, it looks like a DNA, right? So in this structure, when it encapsulated, it will um, uh, arrange itself themselves uh, vertical to the interface. But when we press the droplet and the the symmetrical uh, the symmetry will be changed, so we can see different color of this uh, uh, liquid crystal droplet. In this way, because of the change of the shape, it's also uh, caused by pressing or stressing or even bending. So we used this kind of this integrated uh, soft uh, device to uh, for uh, curvature or um, tensing application, tensing sensing application. Yeah, um, liquid crystal is an amazing structure. It can also, uh, it, the TG, the uh, um, phase transition temperature can also be tuned by their chemical composition. So we also tried to tune the temperature, uh, the TG. And uh, for example, this way, we we, we did this in about three years ago. We tuned the, temp the TG uh, at about uh, uh, 70 to uh, 37 to 38 and in this way it can change color in this area this area is actually the uh indicate whether uh, indi the, the temperature on the on our head can indicate whether you have fever or not so we we make this uh, a soft uh, um, patch which you can put on the head when it change color we can see that it may be sure the the the, the fever or not and furthermore, because of the uh, microsites can also co-incubate with together with cells, and we tried to uh, to incubate them with cells, and the cells can um, healthily grow without uh, obvious um, obvious effect by this uh, micro sensing or with a heat sensing or thermal sensing. So this is also might be interesting to for industry applications, which can. Uh, yeah, just to, sh to see whether the the incubating medium is uh, overheated or not. Yeah, this um, for the uh, liquid crystal rotation at the interface or at the liquid uh, solid interface, which can also be induced by some ions like uh, uh, pH pH or pH value or different types of ions by interact the, the liquid crystal molecules can interact with uh, ions and then induce their rotation. Yeah, for example, like this one in this at this stage is vertically uh, aligned and at this stage when the uh, when it interacts when the pH changes uh, the the alignment of the uh, liquid crystal will be changed by the the molecules at the interface, so they can different. You can see the state of the uh, optical images will change. In this way, we can use them to do the pH sensing. Yeah, this is another way of using. Uh, the mechanism is the same, but we put the the micro organism uh, onto the um, the film, and uh, the 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 interaction between the Microorganism organ, organism with the liquid crystal will induce the rotation of the liquid crystal, which can show the um, different uh, um, optical images. In this way, we can also uh, use the, this uh, device to do the we call the uh, uh, I'll say the ecolysizing. Uh, that previous slides are mainly for the uh, sensing application. Uh, we have also seen that the color sensing is very interesting. And uh, on the other way, color is also the way of our screen works, like the display technology. So we also tried to uh, uh, make our uh, materials together, uh, combined with micro technology to make different different uh, uh, types of devices to show the display applications. In this way, because of the uh, different uh, optical properties, 
we can make this uh, uh, materials in like we um, assemble further these micro capsules into this um, uh, text and by uh, uh, when we uh, take photos by our uh, microscope with or without flash on we can see different colors the different colors are from either from the gold nanoparticles or from the ordered uh, well uh, well well organized uh, uh, silicon oxide uh, photonic uh, crystal structures or the gold structure will make the difference. This can be used for like uh, information display or uh, color sensing. And uh, by put them together with uh, a PDMS, and it can also be bended or not to show different colors from the photonic crystal structures. This is very interesting to students to see uh, and to uh, make some nice uh, and beautiful images. Yeah, by using the laser writing for the same way we can, uh, in uh, you can encode the, the, the film or the layer with different uh, information. And this information can either be seen or uh, hidden by rotate the or by bending this uh, film. So this can also be very interesting for flexible uh, information. We call the uh, anti anti con counter uh, counterfeiting uh, display. Okay, and uh, this is the last part of my presentation. And recently, we uh, developed the uh, uh, device uh, like field. Uh, induced uh, assembly of particles inside the droplet. We call the electromyphoric assembly of particles, uh, namely EMAP, for either uh, particle assembly uh, manipulation and also for display applications. This is the, uh, the scheme of the devices. It includes uh, microwave. Under the microwave, it, uh, in we put the, um, a pair of electrodes underneath. When we have a, a droplet and a medium, and inside there are different colors of the from the particles, by applying electric field across this uh, this uh, microwave, so the particles will assemble along this uh, uh, interface between the droplet and the medium, like shown in this way. It, initially, the drop uh, the particles sit uh, sitting on the uh, at the bottom. By applying electric field at maybe different electric field or frequency, the particles will float up along this interface at the uh, in the medium and till the top. In this way, when we see uh, from the top top view, we can see either the color of the particles or the combination of the particles and the droplet. And in this, so this is the, the way of uh, um, Micropixel works in display technology, so we have put this uh, together into the uh, to to integrate devices to show yeah by showing different colors we can see that the the display uh, devices can show uh, information with wide wide view angle we can view the same information in uh, uh, like uh, more than one hundred and seventy degree, and this uh, because of the um, I have tuned the density of the particles and the uh, water phase. We can see the image can still be uh, maintained after switching off the uh, electric field. So this is called uh, bi-stability. I also add a semi in, in the front because it's not a real bi-stability. It's, it's semi bi-stability. So we will further uh, tune the uh, liquid and the drop uh, particle properties to make the, this real bi-stable. And this device is quite stable. It's uh, like after um, 10 hundred, 10 thousand uh, uh, time uh, uh, recycling, it still switches on and off well. Yeah. And we have also tried to understand the mechanism behind. We see that the, the age of the letters are also very uh, Obvious and also it's very interesting to further investigate whether at the age the the assembly of the particles uh, show different way because we applied the same electrical field but at the age is different it might be induced by the electric field or also by the 
the a contrast between these uh, uh, materials. Okay, this is our my uh, conclusion. So we have make uh, uh, cr uh, used and also create uh, some um, droplet generation methods for different uh, uh, possibilities of making droplets. And the droplet confined assembly of nanoparticles, uh, liquid crystals, and even maybe in the future DNAs or other materials can also be used. The application could be for sensing, like uh, ion sensing, molecule sensing, temperature sensing, and uh, coverage sensing, and uh, displays. <clears throat> and in the future, we will further work on the microfluidics, especially still on the droplet-based microfluidics. For preparing the advanced materials, the soft materials for life science, and the smart materials for intelligent devices. Okay, I would like to thank, uh, thank you all for uh, joining us in this presentation and uh, welcome to visit us at SNU uh, located at Guangzhou, which is uh, uh, actually nearby Hong Kong and uh, Singapore and uh, Japan. If somebody just pass by, visit, pay a visit to us, you are all welcome. And uh, thank you all again for the listening and uh, I will stay here for some further questions. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Lingling. Ling. Uh, I see already that we have some questions in the chat, but given the time right now, let's um, let's just have both talks and then we'll take all questions at the end. I hope that's okay with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would. Uh, yes. Thank you. So, Ghosty, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. Wonderful. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Gozdi Dermis, and she is um, <clears throat> uh, in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. Uh, she did her postdoctoral work at Stanford with uh, Ron Davis at the Genome Technology Institute, or sorry, Genome Technology Center. And uh, she got her PhD um, at Brown University uh, with a minor in innovation management and entrepreneurship. She has you know, many accolades uh, on her CV, including uh, the uh, uh, Fulbright Scholar um, from Boston University. Uh, and she is also one of the top innovators under 35 listed by MIT Technology Review and also received the Career Award from the uh, Burroughs Welcome Fund um, and many, many other uh, wonderful awards and titles. Um, to get to her talk more quickly, I won't uh, list out all of them, but uh, let's hear her sharing on magnetic magnetic levitation of cells for applications in biology and medicine. So welcome, Gozdi. Uh, thanks so much, Angela and Cindy for the kind uh, invitation. So I'm uh, very excited to share you uh, and tell you more about our work. Uh, uh, on magnetic levitation of cells. So today I'll I'll cover how we levitate cells and how we apply uh, this new phenomenon to different applications in biology and medicine. And I'm an assistant professor at Stanford. And after the talk, uh, I'm happy to answer the questions. And if you have more questions, please feel free to email me on my uh, email. Uh, so, uh, as Angela mentioned, I started as a postdoc at Stanford uh, around like 2014. And if you remember this movie, Back to the Future, uh, we were supposed to go back to the future around like 2014, 15. So that's uh, where actually this research uh, kind of started uh, as well. So in this movie, uh, the uh, the future uh, was kind of... Uh, envisioned as like we would be having this like levitating hoverboards or levitating cars. Uh, we're not there yet uh, in terms of the technology piece, uh, but uh, being in the Silicon Valley, I mean, we, we I think see like new developments, for instance, like self, self-driving cars or smartphones or smartwatches. So uh, most of us have access to these uh, smart watches and smart technologies. Uh, but once we look at the... Um, uh, I guess like the healthcare system or the medical system, uh, we believe that uh, most of these new developments are not uh, there uh, to really monitor health and disease. And uh, as a bioengineer, uh, I believe that our bodies like uh, contain different uh, biological information. Uh, and if we can uh, really develop like new tools uh, that are really sensitive, that are available to uh, different uh, groups uh, all around the world, 
uh, we believe that we can really understand our health uh, by just uh, developing these very sensitive and precise tools. Uh, so we want to understand uh, overall uh, what it means to be healthy versus what it means to be uh, having a disease. Uh, so our group is focusing on developing new tools to really understand this phenomenon. And our inspiration is actually coming from uh, this experiment, the magnetic levitation of frog. So I also included the links. Uh, so this is the first uh, experiment on Earth uh, to show that we can eliminate gravity. So uh, here you see that the frog is being levitated under a very high magnetic field, which is more than 10 Tesla. And I'll show you uh, uh, actually how much work <laughs> and thought went into this experiment. And this is done by Andre Geim, who has a Nobel Prize for discovering graphene, but he, he also got, got this IG Nobel Prize for this experiment. Uh, but to be able to do this uh, experiment, they needed a very high uh, magnetic field and very a uh, big setup. As you see, the setup is very huge. And these are the frogs that are uh, waiting to get levitated in the high magnetic field. So now uh, they turn on the magnetic field and the frog is kind of just in the air. It's just, I think, trying to move its legs. So that's why there is a momentum. So it's just like turning around. But um, this is the first experiment on Earth to show that we can eliminate gravity and pretty much mimic the microgravity environment of the space. And after that, uh, they show that other living organisms or objects could be levitated under this magnetic field. So I, uh, when I started my uh, postdoctoral work at Stanford, I was uh, excited by this concept. And we were thinking about how we can generate a very high magnetic field. So the only medical uh, tool that we can uh, access to generate this um, big uh, or high magnetic field is the MRI machine. And now being in the radiology department, I don't have daily access. And as you know, MRI is like very bulky and it's very expensive. But over the years, we showed that actually we don't need this uh, big of a high magnetic field. We can just use off the shelf magnets and uh, we can just uh, put them in a unique configuration. And we uh, managed to build it in a very portable setup that you can just carry in your pocket. And uh, we showed that actually this uh, unique magnetic configuration uh, enables us to levitate single cells. So for instance, in this video, we see some cancer cells that are being levitated and the way that they fall and the rate that they fall actually uh, tells us something unique about their uh, biological status. And just to go over uh, what uh, we do uh, in our um, levitation device and just a simple physics. So as I mentioned, uh, we have two magnets uh, that are uh, positioned at the north to north or south to south configuration. And to be able to levitate cells, uh, cells are diamagnetic. Uh, so we introduce them in a paramagnetic media to be able to generate some magnetic susceptibility difference. And once we uh, add the cells into the paramagnetic media and let them levitate, uh, once they come into the equilibration position, as you see in this uh, cartoon, uh, there are two forces acting on the cells, uh, which is the gravitational force trying to pull the cells down. And we balance this force with the magnetic forces that we introduce uh, uh, with the magnets. And uh, over the years, we did so many different experiments and so many different theoretical calculations. And we uh, showed that the uh, equilibration position of the cell is mainly uh, depending on the uh, inherent density of the of, of the cell. So uh, for instance, like if you mix like different cell types, as you see in this uh, cartoon B, uh, each cell will go to a unique uh, levitation position that's based on their uh, density. Or uh, in some cases, if the cells are uh, magnetic, there will be some magnetic um, susceptibility effect, but it's uh, dominantly the cellular density of the cell. And uh, just to show you uh, how the, the levitation occurs in real time. So we have actually a microfluidic system, which we turned also into a microfluidic form. So the channel that we have is like uh, one millimeter. And you can think this technology as a centrifuge where we can centrifuge uh, each single cell. So here you see that some red blood cells are uh, getting levitated and now um, all of the cells came into their equilibration position. And in, in each micron of uh, this one millimeter uh, macro channel, 
uh, there is a density gradient. So each cell uh, will go to uh, their unique uh, density position. And we show that uh, although it's the same blood sample, uh, some of the cells are uh, equilibrating at different levitation positions, which I, I will tell you uh, why it's significant in uh, the next slides. Uh, but uh, we think that this is a new dimension that hasn't been explored uh, in the literature before. Uh, so it's a new dimension for single cell analysis, and we pretty much apply it to two different, uh, two main areas. So my main area in my group is looking at uh, label-free separation and sorting of cells, uh, because in the literature, uh, it's very well known uh, about uh, dense, different uh, dense ranges of different, for instance, like blood cells. And we show that uh, if we mix different uh, cell groups, uh, since it's pretty much uh, sorting or separating cells based on density, uh, we can pretty much separate different cell types at like different levitation bands, as you see here. And since we have uh, kind of coupled uh, the levitation device uh, with uh, imaging tools, uh, we can also do label-free uh, monitoring of different cellular events. So we are also uh, actively uh, trying to understand um, different uh, cellular mechanisms. So for instance, here we show that once we activate immune cells, um, their levitation position changes. So activated uh, white blood cells versus resting white blood cells has different uh, levitation bands. So we are uh, trying to sort these cells and understand their biological uh, properties or new biomarkers. And also we are interested in like point of care tools and for some applications, for instance, like sickle cell disease, uh, it's well known that red blood cells have, uh, uh, red blood cells can become denser. And by just taking a levitation image, we can pretty much monitor the sickle cell disease. So uh, this is a summary of like different areas that we are applying this. So we think it's a, blood, a platform technology. So as I mentioned, uh, we work on like biomarker-free uh, cell sorting. Uh, we are also uh, looking at uh, how we can apply this tool to uh, uh, apply it to point of care technologies, especially levitating bacteria and looking at their drug susceptibility. So today I'm not going to show too much of uh, that work, but uh, we are also interested in uh, working with uh, microorganisms and levitating them and understanding their uh, unique biology. And uh, I'll also show like uh, very small examples of how we can now uh, use levitation to code cells into different uh, 3D structures for tissue engineering and regenerative purposes. And uh, the main area that we work is cancer. Uh, so uh, I'll show you some brief examples of how we... Uh, apply levitation for uh, understanding rare cancer cells in blood. Uh, and mostly we are interested in circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor ag aggregates. Uh, these cells are very rare, but uh, uh, they are actually very important and they have a uh, huge impact for cancer because they can uh, kind of uh, originate from a t primary tumor site and they can colonize into the bloodstream and they can go uh, into a secondary tumor site. So they can, uh, they pretty much cause the metastasis. And if we can understand their uh, biological properties or new biomarkers, we believe that uh, we can maybe detect cancer earlier, especially the metastasis earlier. And in the microfluidic fields, uh, there has been many, many different approaches to catch these rare cells because, I mean, since they are very important, um, so many uh, great technologies have been developed over the years. And most of the technologies look at the surface properties of these cells, trying to attach uh, some anti antibodies or magnetic beads to pull these cells from uh, the blood. Some other technologies looked at the physical properties uh, rather than relying on uh, some surface markers, especially looking at electrical charge or size and deformability of these cells. And some technologies actually explore density uh, to differentiate uh, cancer cells from the blood cells. But we think since most of these density tools, density-based tools are not uh, very precise at the single cell level, uh, we think that uh, magnetic levitation come uh, as a new uh, 
dimension to catch rare cells from blood. And as you know, for cancer, there's always this um, challenge with the heterogeneity of the disease. So naturally, cancer is very heterogeneous and there are so many different surface markers. So uh, we don't want to rely on any biomarkers, but maybe use uh, physical uh, properties of the cells, especially density to catch these cells from the circulation and uh, one unique thing about the circulating uh, tumor cells so most of the uh, most aggressive circulating tumor cells are actually more mesenchymal like so uh, and to catch the mesenchymal or more vimentin expressing cells uh, actually we can't rely on any surface biomarkers so that's mostly expressed inside the cell so that's why uh, our goal is to uh, use levitation uh, and uh, try to uh, detect and sort these rare cells from blood. So, and our motivation comes from uh, our uh, very early experiments. So, what we did, uh, we levitated uh, healthy uh, white blood cells and red blood cells, and then we levitated different uh, cancer types. And as we show here, uh, we show that first of all, each cell has a unique levitation profile uh, based uh, on the density of the cell. Uh, and we show that uh, cancer cells are significantly less dense compared to uh, red blood and white blood cells. So as you see here, for instance, like breast cancer cells, since they have more lipids, uh, naturally, uh, they can uh, levitate very high uh, in our uh, microfluidic chambers. And uh, according to the literature, uh, cancer cells are also known to be less dense compared to red blood and white blood cells. So. And since we can image each cell here, uh, each levitating cell uh, in the device, uh, we can also now calculate uh, the density or levitation height of the cell and uh, also calculate the size. Uh, and we can pretty much generate this like graphs looking at the facts sorting data. And uh, once we do this like PCA analysis, we show that each, each cancer cell line or each cancer cell has a unique um, a signature that's very significantly different than the uh, healthy red blood and white blood cells. So that's how, why, how we got excited. But the initial setup would only uh, process 30 microliters of blood. So we ha had to bring it to a level where we can process at least like 10 mLs of blood. So, and just to appreciate the number of circulating tumor cells or clusters. So in our blood, there is billions of red blood cells, millions of uh, white blood cells, and we have only one to like thousand circulating tumor cells. So uh, that's where the microfluidic comes in. Uh, so our goal was to make a device where we don't need to process the whole blood, but we just put the uh, blood in and uh, within a couple minutes, uh, the whole blood would separate. So uh, we our goal is to collect the healthy red blood and white blood cells at the top uh, bottom chamber and any any cell that shouldn't be in a healthy blood sample uh we collect them at the top levitation chamber and then we do a downstream analysis so this is the initial setup uh, where we uh, did uh, in our lab at stanford and as you see like we just use like real-time imaging so the parameters during sorting we can also adjust based on different patient samples so here uh, we are showing that uh, we are working with the whole blood and this is the uh, pretty much the levitation chip so we have an inlet and then two outlets and with the syringe pumps and uh, also in the real-time imaging uh, we can pretty much control uh, the flow rates to get the most pure uh, circulating tumor cells and just to show you uh, the real-time uh, sorting of the whole blood so here uh, we spike some cancer cells into the blood so uh, the bottom layer the most red <laughs> layer that you see uh, along the chamber uh, along the channel is the red blood cells and then in the middle layer we have some white blood cells uh, that is more pinkish and the, this little little dots that you see that's going to the top, top chamber is the cancer cells that we spiked into the blood and uh, along the channel also uh, we also can collect clusters so single cell versus uh, the cluster of the same cell, same cell type since it's the same inherent uh, cell type uh, we can collect them at the same outlet. So since we are depending on the density, since it's the same cell type, uh, we don't need to do too much manipulation into our microfluidic design. 
and we show that uh, we can get uh, very pure cancer cells out. So we can pretty much deplete white blood cells uh, and then get pure uh, cancer cell population. And over the years, we are trying to make this device more high throughput. So for instance, the early initial uh, design, we were able to process two mLs of whole blood within one hour in one device. So you can multiplex it and try to increase the throughput uh, by just uh, making parallel devices run. Uh, and I'll just show you some examples of the heterogeneity of the circulating tumor cells that we collect. So we typically work with uh, renal cell carcinoma or lung cancer. And we here show that since we're not relying on uh, surface markers, uh, we can get the epithelial, mesenchymal, and EMT-like uh, circulating cells. And each patient has different number of circulating tumor cells per ml in blood. So he, the number varies a lot. But I would like to point out one uh, specific example. For instance, like in this renal uh, cancer patient, uh, most of the cells are uh, mesenchymal. Uh, and if we relied on an epithelial marker, we would miss most of these cells, at least uh, 200 cells per ml. Uh, and we would assume that this patient didn't have any circulating tumor cells, but in reality, we see a lot of mesenchymal uh, cancer cells are in circulation. And we are also observing, and our, uh, others in the field are also observing some uh, very interesting cell types. So we call them hybrid cells. So uh, these cells are uh, just one cell, and it has both the cancer markers and the normal blood cell characteristics. So we think, and uh, our collaborators have uh, more data uh, they published recently that uh, showing that these hybrid cells, the double positive cells, could be uh, early indicators of uh, cancer because they are more uh, pronounced uh, before drug therapy. But once the patient gets the therapy uh, or cancer uh, drugs, their number uh, really significantly decreases. So we think that these cells could hold some information about how we can detect cancer early. And uh, another uh, marker for cancer aggressiveness is the CTC aggregates. So these are the clusters. And uh, we also can catch these clusters from blood. And we show that uh, they are also heterogeneous based on their Vimentin expression. So there are some clusters with, that are Vimentin negative versus positive. So now we are trying to understand what this heterogeneity means. Uh, we, are also, we can also look at the changes of the heterogeneity of these cells uh, when uh, there is a therapy, for instance, here, we were interested in looking at the biology of these cells once the patient uh, was off treatment for two weeks. And uh, we show that the number of the circulating cells are increasing as expected because there is no therapy. But interestingly, the biological uh, status of these cells are also changing. So we now are uh, in investigating what it means for the cancer therapy. And we also looked at how we can uh, work with these cells uh, and look at their uh, downstream characteristics because working with single CTCs or clusters are very challenging. Uh, so it took us some time to optimize our protocols. But uh, just to show you, for instance, once we do this, like tr single cell transcriptomics, we don't see any EPCAM expression. So we think that uh, re not relying on any epithelial marker could be a good strategy to catch these cells from blood. And we are also interested in uh, the question is that like, can we use these cells and maybe uh, can we see the uh, origin of the tumor? So for instance, for renal cell carcinoma uh, patients, uh, we uh, show that in the transcriptome of these cells, there is this protein called acoparin 2 and it's significantly and just expressed in kidney. So we think maybe uh, by just looking at these cells, catching them and looking at their transcriptomic data, uh, we can uh, see the tumor, tumor origin. So overall, uh, just to summarize this part, uh, we, we our aim is to go, uh, our goal is to make a biomarker free uh, levitation based liquid biopsy. So we show that we can get, uh, we can catch these rare cells from blood and we show that we can also do the downstream analysis for further uh, biological discoveries or uh, biological uh, discoveries for new biomarkers. And I would like to also briefly show you other applications that we are also working on. So as uh, at the beginning of my talk, I showed this video. So 
since we have um, made our tool compatible with imaging, real-time imaging, we can uh, look at uh, cellular response of these cells. So for instance, these are some cancer cells that we uh, introduce some uh, drugs. And uh, here, uh, when they go from green to red, it means that each cell uh, is dying. But as you see, uh, the rate uh, of each single cell uh, reacting to the drug that we introduce is different. So we think that we can look at different drugs and we can look at the survivors versus uh, non-survivors and uh, sort them for further drug screening. So here, uh, again, like when there is no treatment, the levitation profile of the cells does, doesn't change. But the, when there's an environmental stressor, we see the uh, falling down of each cell uh, very precisely. And we are pretty much... Uh, using this tool to look at uh, drug effects. So for instance, here, uh, we also introduced breast cancer cells, uh, just to uh, Dr. Rubicin, and show, we show that live cells versus dead cells uh, will separate into different levitation bands. And over time, uh, by just using our uh, microfluidic tools, now we can sort live and dead cells. And uh, we think that it's pretty much applicable to different applications. So any single cell prep uh, that the researchers are trying to do, uh, we think that this could be just as a simple way just to remove debris from your cell culture, or uh, I think it could be a way uh, for like sorting droplets or any other applications that we can think of. Uh, once there's a dense difference, uh, I think our uh, microfluidic tool is sensitive enough uh, to sort uh, any entity that you are interested in. And another area, so I'll just give like a couple examples. Uh, so for instance, like sickle cell disease, uh, we are also actively working on uh, looking at the effects of different gene therapies or new uh, drugs uh, to pretty much um, correct the sickle cell disease. So here we show that we can pretty much monitor different red blood cell types uh, of of the sickle cell disease because it's also a disease type that affects the density of red blood cells. So uh, we show that our technology is sensitive to catch these uh, very little, uh, very small dense differences. And uh, we are interested in like challenging cell types. So for instance, in this study uh, by collaborating with Sean Wu and Joe Wu, uh, we show that uh, we can sort uh, cardiomyocytes because, in fact, uh, sorting, since cardiomyocytes are very big cell types, uh, there is all, always a challenge to sort live cardiomyocytes uh, at the end of effect sorting. But here uh, we show that uh, we can look at the lipid content of diseased uh, versus healthy cardiomyocytes and uh, we can sort them based on their lipid content because in this specific cell types, our collaborators were interested in lipid storing cardiomyocytes, but there, there's not many uh, good technologies to sort them. But here we show that uh, once the cardiomyocytes are accumulating lipids, uh, uh, as you see in uh, figure C, uh, we started to see this uh, cell uh, subpopulation that's levitating very high uh, among our chamber. So we were able to show that uh, we can. We were able to sort them and show that their uh, biological uh, properties were different, and the ones that are levitating at the top chamber were the uh, cardiomyocyte populations that had that uh, unique uh, gene uh, gene modification that our collaborators were interested, in. and we are also. I mean, so far I showed you how we use levitation to to decode a blood sample or a cell sample, but we are also interested in by just using magnetism to code cells into different configurations. So for instance, here uh, we show that by just using density, uh, we can uh, code cells into different uh, dimensions that we want. So for instance, this is a different setup. So we use the ring magnet system, uh, but the idea is the same by just using density. Uh, we can pretty much code cells into different 3D configurations, which is uh, uh, very exciting for us just to use density and levitation to code different uh, 3D structures for regenerative purposes. 
And uh, we also, I, I, I was fortunate to see how uh, a technology can be translated from the lab setting to the market. So we have a startup company called uh, levitasbio.com uh, is the website. If you are interested, looking at uh, different uh, versions of the technology. So I've shown you in the earlier slides how we had it in the lab. And this is an initial setup that we tested uh, at Stanford. And now uh, different researchers at different parts of the world are also testing it for different applications. And so far, it's a, it's now at, at the desktop level. And now uh, you can uh, sort uh, and look at like different multiple sa samples at the same time, which is like very exciting for me because during my postdoctoral days, I really suffered just to uh, sort one sample at a time. But I think uh, by just automatization of the technology, uh, I think the throughput will also increase. Uh, just to uh, summarize uh, the talk, uh, so we uh, I showed you today like different examples about le magnetic levitation of cells and uh, automated technology. So uh, we think that it's a complete uh, single cell analysis platform where we can identify the cells, quantify them, isolate them. And now by looking at the real-time response, uh, we can also uh, screen different compounds for personalized medicine. So I would like to acknowledge our funding sources and collaborators and my lab. Uh, and I would like to thank you for your time and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gazdi. Both really wonderful talks. Um, <clears throat> Ling Ling, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, that's great. Yeah, we have a lot of questions in the chat. So I'll just uh, go through them, uh, I guess, uh, one by one. So the first question, Question we have in the chat is from um, John Lee, and he, uh, I guess this question is addressed to Ling Ling. So nice talk as exosomes are hot topics uh, in medicine. Can your droplets be modified on the surface to target specific tissues? For example, how easy would it be to add peptides or DNA or RNA onto the surface? Uh, yes, uh, actually, I, I also uh, privately uh, answered the question to the to the people who presented the, the uh, but I repeat it here again. Uh, for this question, and as I think that the <clears throat> um, the uh, DNAs or the peptide can be easily encapsulated into the droplet, but the whether it can be on the surface depending on the uh, amphiphilic properties of the molecules. In fact, some peptide are also can. Uh, or proteins and even DNAs can be modified uh, as surfactant to be used in some systems. So it it's uh, it will depend on which type of the molecules it would be. And uh, yeah, that this I hope this can uh, answer the question. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the next question we have is from Nicholas: uh, Is the colorimetric patch sensitive to ambient temperatures when placed on someone's forehead? Yes, it sensed to the uh, environmental uh, temperature. And uh, I think the temp environmental temperature is typically lower than 37 degrees, especially for patients. They would like to have a comfortable temperature inside. But if the temperature is higher than um, like 37, 38, it may be, and the environmental temperature even have more effect on the sensor. Yeah, that's it. Okay, and Myra's uh, question is, uh, thanks for a great talk. What order of magnitude of forces can you sense with the LC droplets for pressure or curvature sensing? And could it be used to study the strength of bonding between particles or cells? Yeah, this is a very nice question, in fact. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, to the uh, deep understanding of this sensing technology is actually dependent on the how much the shape of the droplet can be uh, like pressed or stretched. And uh, I think the uh, for the bond between particles is quite, uh, I think the, the, the length scale is not mm, in the range of uh, sensibility. Mm. Okay, Sai asks, uh, could you elaborate on how the multi-tier microparticles are incorporated with flexible polymer materials 
for applications in force sensing? Are the particles pasted onto the substrate or embedded into the film? Hey, um, the particles actually uh, mostly on the surface is either metal or the uh, silicon oxide. It can be easily uh, combined with PDMS or PET and some uh, flexible um, materials. And for the like uh, hydrophobic uh, surface like Teflon, uh, we would also um, uh, make some channels on the surface and then put the microparticles along the channels. It, it, because they are, the particles are still on the micro scale, it can assemble and uh, along to the channel uh, uh, compactly, yeah. Mm, okay, I actually have a question myself. So I did notice that you are able to make like really interesting shapes and surface textures on the particles. And I wonder yeah. if you have done any work to use those as a sort of almost like a biomimicking of microbes of different morphology or shape or, or surface texture to, you know, measure things like whether those things have an effect on the micro, uh, the, 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 the response of the host to, to, to such kind of microbes or something like that. Uh, yes, I think you, you are right. Uh, in fact, we make this uh, different types of uh, surface structure is uh, on one hand, the students are very interested on the, uh, in these uh, structures to see whether how much and how uh, beautiful we can make the structures be. And on the other hand, because of the, like the metal structure and the uh, nano wire structure, they are very sensible to the environment. And uh, uh, even when we move the, uh, the, the devices from one room to the other room, maybe you can see the uh, some difference. And uh, also in summer and in winter, we can also have different uh, results. There, so I think it's quite uh, um, sensible to uh, to environment and even to the, to the, not only the structure itself, but also to the materials, the combination of the materials can be uh, designed as you want, I, I hope. But uh, what's the, what I can oh, answer? I yeah, I was wondering if you uh, have thought about using those as a way to mimic uh, microbes and, you know, how microbes might interact with things they want to infect or host organisms. Uh, not yet, but uh, one of my colleagues is working on the, like, using the uh, micro, we, we call this one micro particle as one micro sensing to put on the tip of an uh, electrode to use this as a, uh, electrochemical combined with optical sensing to probe the DNA, uh, the single cell, uh, uh, like a single cell in a micro environment in incubated in together with the the growth of the, the, the cell, the viability of the cells. That's what we are doing now. Got it, got it. Okay, very cool. So I think the next couple of questions are for Gazdi. Um, the first one from John asks, why do the activated PM, PMN levitate differently from inactivated ones? And are there any applications for cancer resistance to treatment? I guess you sort of answered that in your talk already. I don't know if you want to add anything more. Uh, or... Yeah, sure. Just to add like why activated cells are levitating differently. So uh, especially when the white blood cells are getting activated, there is more react to oxygen species and they are paramagnetic. So that affects the levitation profiles, which is uh, what makes it like interesting. So in some rare cases, if there's a paramagnetic difference or magnetic susceptible difference, you catch it. Uh, and detected in the system, but for this activated cells is the react to oxygen species. Okay, and um, and the follow up from John is uh, as intracellular organelles might have different responses to magnetic fields. Are there any studies to see how they respond differently? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I, I mean, we levitated organelles just to see if, we, for instance, if we can levitate mitochondria. And I see a question about chronic fatigue syndrome, I guess. So that's a study that we did with Ron Davis uh, to look at like different mitochondria samples from different patients. But we never investigated the magnetic field effect. So I'm sure it's going to be interesting. But yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I've definitely seen work that shows like the nucleus for sure has like a, you know, some magnetic properties and respond um, in interesting ways to 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 fields. Uh, okay, Magda 
and myself have similar questions. So I might yeah. combine them. So she asked how accessible or affordable is the device? And my question is whether you think it could be eventually get to a point where it could be used in remote areas, considering like power supply or portability. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so the commercialized, ver ver I mean, uh, the device is portable. So if you use this version that we just published, for instance, in 2015, it's just like two magnets and you assemble them with um, like laser cut parts. And uh, I know, for instance, like one PhD student at Stanford took it to uh, test it for malaria samples to Africa. So it's pretty much portable as long as you have a portable imaging system and if the imaging part has the uh, sensitivity to image cells. So we show that it's applicable for point of care uh, sensing tools. Uh, so the com but the commercial version, uh, the the goal is to sort uh, lots of volume. So that part is not that portable. But I think still compared to facts, it's portable. To be honest, uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, the question about I think you're asking about the whole blood uh, filtration and can we pretty much fil filter these cells from the blood? Right. I think there are also questions about the throughput. And will it ever achieve that throughput? So yeah, I think that's a good technical challenge for us because, uh, and we show that like we can catch these cells and sort them very effectively, but the whole blood volume and filtration of the cancer cells and clean sink, uh, that's one application that I am personally very interested in. But I think in terms of the engineering piece on the microfluidics, and the magnetic design, we still uh, need some time to make it perfect. It's not there yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. And since you mentioned sorting like by, you know, live dead, so I'm assuming that the live cells do survive the sorting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> the cells that I was showing, the beating cardiomyocytes, uh, uh, they were viable. And actually, I, I did not include that data. For instance, for cancer cells, after we sort them, we culture them. So we show that uh, the paramagnetic media doesn't affect their viability and then uh, their transcriptome also uh, stays the same. So the sorting is gentle. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the yeah. flow rate. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Seth asks, and this is relevant to what you just mentioned, how much do you have to dilute the blood, if mm. any, uh, to run it through the device? So yeah, the R standard protocol is um, like one to 10 dilution, but I would also want to mention about the different patient samples because uh, that's also something that's uh, interesting depending on the stage of the patient and how much drug therapy the patient had, the number of cells are changing. For some patients, we don't have to dilute that much, for instance, because there is very low white blood cell amount. So for those samples, we do, let's say, one to two. So I think it's sample dependent. Uh, but I think making, uh, doing that real-time imaging really helps to depend uh, to decide on the dilution. But if it's a new sample that we don't know anything about, it's one to 10 dilution most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Sai asks, does the magnetic field need to be tuned based on the different cell types that you are studying and how sensitive is it to separating cells with similar densities? Yeah, I can share the screen. So that's a very good question. So that's actually a one, uh, application, I mean, one, uh, aspect that I didn't mention, but we, uh, adjust the sensitivity of the device by changing the paramagnetism of the solution. So for instance, like, uh, we can levitate at like different paramagnetic media concentrations and we can fine tune where we levitate the same uh, cell with the same density. So uh, yeah, if you want to make a more sensitive measurement, you just decrease the gadolinium concentration or paramagnetic media. So that's how we uh, change the sensitivity of the technology. I see. I see. Okay. And that's relevant, I guess, to Nicholas's question about sensitivity to be used. I mean, right now you guys are using it to capture the cells and maybe mm -hmm. to do studies on them afterwards. But I think what Nicholas is asking is whether you could even use it to filter and remove yeah, the yeah, CTCs yeah. and then I'm guessing to put the rest of the blood back, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's where I want to go personally. And I think the next challenge is like we are using a paramagnetic media. Is it safe to put it back? But the ones, uh, the one that we are using is FDA approved. So, uh, but I think yeah, eventually it could be a way to like very similar to a dialysis technology, but I think to cleanse all the blood, the throughput and flow rates yeah. needs to be improved. But I think that's where we want to personally go.
uh, in the lab. Yeah. 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 Very exciting. Um, Mark has turned on his camera, so I'm guessing he would like to ask the questions himself. So please go ahead. Uh, I think you're still mute. Yeah, so uh, actually just a bit of history too. Steve Quay was a Stanford pathologist. He founded Salutar that made the first gadolinium MRI mm -hmm. contrast agents. And I worked for him. I was like the seventh employee or something for about a year. And so gadolinium goes way back. I worked on MRI a long time ago. But anyway, um, so just wondering how close are you to commercialization? Uh, is, is this a commercial product or mm -hmm. product? And, okay. Cost. Yeah, it's commercial. So the sorting device, uh, I mean, the desktop device is commercially available right now. So I think the first uh, system was just one sample at a time. Now the, you can multiplex it to, I think, up to four uh, samples. Uh, and now they built in some functions about, you know, changing the temperature. So you can pretty much uh, keep the cells at different temperatures, depending on different applications. So it's commercially available uh, if you're interested, I can email the website to you or uh, uh, I'll look it up. I'll look check it, up. it more. And then uh, how long does it take for the analysis to get things separated? Is that uh, so, uh, yeah, it's important. typically depending on the cell size. Like if the cells are like really big, uh, it takes a like couple minutes. Uh, but let's say red blood cells are smaller. So it takes like 20 minutes. So I think the commercial device does like a two minute minute uh, levitation and then it just sorts them. Yeah, there's a, I, I participate in angel investing groups. I'm not actually an investor, but um, chemical angels, MIT alumni angels. So if you ever need additional funding, you know, there, there's a lot of companies out there looking for interesting startups. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions from other uh, members of the audience that didn't get a chance to type it into the chat or would like to ask both uh, Dr. Shrey and Dr. Dermis, anyone? Last chance. Um, okay, if, oh, uh, okay, yeah. If not, I guess uh, then we can um, end the session here today. Uh, thank you again to both of our speakers for coming and especially Gozdi at such a, like a unhumanly hour uh, for you. Um, and we, you know, we welcome everyone to come back for our, the next uh, iteration of our program, which will be on February 4th um, at the same time. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>